Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Faisal Shaheen. I'm the director of a think tank called CLASS, the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Uh, really glad to be here today to be talking about how we escape growth dependency. It's a question that's been there for a long time. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times we point out that GDP or gross domestic product is not a great measure of society for various different reasons. We seem to only become more and more wedded to it. Um, and so today I'm really interested in hearing about Positive Money's new report. I know that there's copies around the room and I thank Fran and her team for putting it together. Um, I think it offers sort of a new angle. I think we've spoken quite a bit about how GDP um, and the connections to the environment um, in particular, somewhere where that, where that measure is particularly um, damaging. Um, but I know that in this report, there's talk of the, the, the links to debt and how um, our reliance on debt also mean, makes us growth dependent. So I'll just kick off with Fran, who's going to explain the report, um, and then we'll move on to Kate, and then we'll have um, some response from the three politicians on the panel. Great, thanks, Fraser. I'll stand up. Um, so yeah, first of all, just thank you all for coming. I think when we started this research project a couple of years ago, we were pretty pessimistic about when we launched the report whether we'd be able to get policymakers interested, and we definitely didn't think we'd be able to host a report launch in Parliament. And I think one of the reasons that we've been able to do that is because we've seen over the last two years the economy becoming ever more uncertain, uh, even going into decline, and we're, we're seeing you know, the deep structural issues, the problems with our e economy becoming ever more obvious. Uh, and so more and more people are willing to kind of be more open-minded about what isn't working in terms of an economy that serves society. So ever since the economics discipline uh, existed, people have asked the question, like, what's the best measure of economic progress? So if we think of, about the UK economy today, don't worry, come in. I think there's a couple more seats um, in the back. Uh, let's consider some options. So wage growth, that is the lowest since Victorian times. Debt to GDP, that is at record highs. Asset prices, uh, they're at record highs too. And whilst that might be good for some, it is definitely not for the growing number of people who are left off the property ladder or out of the stock market. And by the metrics which show real people's experiences of the economy, the evidence is pretty bleak. While the number of uh, UK millionaires has shot up to 41 by 41% in the last five years, not least because of the asset price rises, we're seeing one in eight workers in the UK economy that can't afford three meals a day low-paid jobs are proliferating and food bank use is soaring. And it's not much better globally. 1% of the po global population own 45% of the world's wealth. And scientists say we have approximately three years left before catastrophic climate change is unleashed. So our economic system is dysfunctional at its core, and we do need a new model and new ways to measure its success. And since we were founded, Positive Money has always believed that it's possible to move beyond the reductionist conversations around GDP growth. And to do that, we've focused as an organisation on a key driver of the dysfunctioning economy, which is high levels of private and public debt. But first, I just want to talk about what the problem is with GDP growth. So GDP is the sum um, total of all goods and services being produced in the economy, and for almost every pound, dollar, and uh, euro that makes up that statistics, GDP also then measures some usage, uh, input, or energy of natural resources, and also the release, some output of pollution and waste. And it is all of this activity that does have a real tangible impact on our environment and ecosystems. Uh, and if I was going to show you a slide, which I'm not going to be able to do, what you would see is that as GDP, the trajectory of GDP has increased over the last um, 100 years, so has the resource use of things like iron ore, bauxite, the metals that we kind of need to uh, do a lot of the production and consumption in our modern economy. And so infinite growth on a finite planet essentially ensures that we, as a, um, as a species, will actually extinct ourselves in the coming decades or millennia. Now, some economists have looked at the possibility of decoupling GDP growth from resource consumption or carbon dioxide emissions. And that was the second slide I was going to show you. Um, and th this would involve basically trying to decouple the trajectory of, of GDP growth going up from resource use, which would need to um, fall, and also carbon dioxide emissions. 
So the idea is that you can increase GDP activity with ever more um, kind of weightless uh, economic activity, such as software or computer apps, etc. However, the, the evidence uh, shows that this isn't happening fast enough. So I think that a very appealing um, argument, which you know, a lot of people are attracted to, is you know, technology will come and save us all, and we don't need to worry too much because... Um, we, can, we can put all of our hopes in technological innovation to get us out of this pickle. Well, that's just not going to happen fast enough. And so the, the graph I was going to show you is basically showing that really, if we're going to decouple GDP growth from uh, resource use and, and carbon dioxide emissions, we need um, significant uh, decoupling. We don't just need relative decoupling, we need absolute decoupling. And if that is going to... Uh, be on a trajectory that will keep us within planetary boundaries it is incredibly far away from the trajectory we are on in terms of car carbon dioxide emissions and resource consumption. So why are governments so obsessed with growth if we know that their growth is kind of taking us down a path of no return? Well one reason which I'm sure you all agree is they're continually judged by analysts and commentators on this one figure whether it's going up or down and by how much and it will also have an impact on the amount of interest we pay on government debt. As an example of the focus on this figure, back in November when the budget was announced, actually quite a lot of the uh, media buzz around the, the Chancellor's budget was quite mundane. It was the Office of Budget Responsibility um, downgrading its growth forecast. So we're pretty focused on this one measure at the moment. Um, but we must remember that GDP growth only really became a central concern in the second half of the 20th century, when policymakers adopted it as a kind of way of measuring living standards. And since then, what's happened is we've evolved to, to mean that governments has kind of, there's this kind of circular reasoning where now increasing growth itself is seen as a means of maintaining living standards, reducing poverty and other things. So we see GDP growth as the means to um, increase living standards rather than simply a kind of blunt measure of the economic activity in the economy. And there's also this idea that growth is a way of avoiding difficult questions. So why is there such vast amounts of inequality? Or why is the wage share of GDP falling? Can kind of be masked if, if everything's growing. There's this idea that a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, but many commentators and economists have joked that uh, actually in the current situation a rising tide lifts luxury yachts but sinks everybody else. So we know that these things, that growth isn't actually tackling some of these very serious concerns in our economy. Um, and these drivers tend to be the, the, you know, the result of out of date and incomplete understanding of the economy which is kind of seeped into all levels of our political and economic debate. And despite being debunked by many economists, they still persist in our everyday conversation about how our economy is doing. But there's, uh, there's another overlooked um, source of growth dependency, which the report um, focuses in on in the second half. And that's these high levels of private and public debt, which our con current economy produces. And the key driver of which is our money and banking system. Um, which in its current form burdens society with uh, an endless supply of debt. Uh, while debt, some debt is obviously useful, too much will cripple an economy and lay the foundations for a crash. Um, so Positive Money was, um, was founded to talk about how the monetary system works, its impact on society and the environment. And we propose in this report two reforms to the current monetary system, looking at the way money is created. In the current system, over 97% of our, the money that we use exists as deposits in banks. Um, banks create new money when they make loans, and through this process, money is created as an IOU or a debt. So the vast majority of these new loans that banks create when they make money goes into property and financial markets, um, resulting in high levels of uh, household debt, high asset prices and quite an unstable uh, economic system. And that, coupled with the fact that we've seen uh, wage decline, result, has resulted in households having ever taking on ever um, more debt just to get by. And it means that in the UK, we've got a private debt level which stands at 170% of GDP. 
Not only did these high levels of debt pose quite a serious threat to our financial stability, indeed Andy Haldane, the Chief Economist of the Bank of England, has talked quite a lot about that in the last year, but they also um, fuel this government, the government's kind of single-track focus on pursuing growth at all costs in order to make these debts manageable. Policymakers see increasing income as the easiest way to pay off debt. They believe the best way to do so is by increasing your productive output, i.e. working harder and harder and longer to produce more of the goods and services which GDP measures. And despite the fact that productivity is faltering, underemployment is the new normal, and we've seen a sustained profit wage share split, it's this idea, along with fears of mounting um, debt levels, that locks GDP in, as the overriding policy objective to economic policy. So it's to our peril that government's preoccupation with growth leads to other very important um, concerns, socioeconomic ones and environmental ones, being put on the back burner as they pursue growth at all costs. And it's clear that the challenge of climate change and inequality are just too urgent to ignore. These challenges do require bold rethinking of society's priorities. And we think a good place to start is our dysfunctional money and banking system, which underpins it. So it means a discussion about how we create our money and whether it should be solely privately created as debt by commercial banks in a way which demands unsustainable growth. There are alternatives which could allow us to create money sustainably and a way which works for people and doesn't leave us beholden to financial markets and credit rating agencies. So I just want to talk briefly about our, the two options that we lay out in the paper. Um, so one is utilising this idea of monetary financing, which various economists have started talking about over the last few years. It's also known as sovereign money creation, or QE for people. It would involve the Bank of England creating money um, in a similar way as it did with QE, but rather than creating $475 billion and pumping it into financial markets, as that happened through quantitative easing, uh, the bank could create a smaller amount and ensure that it gets uh, into the real economy, where it can play a role in paying down um, private debt levels. And this could be done in a few ways, a couple of which which economists have put forward are such as um, putting it specifically into government spending, even on green infrastructure, so that it actually can contribute to the green transition we need, or even a citizen's dividend to go directly into paying down um, private sector debt. But there is also scope to go even further to what we call a fully-fledged sovereign money system, which would essentially be stripping banks of their power to create money as debt. And it would decouple two really important functions of money as a means of payment and a means of credit in the system. And in the process would enable us to end too big to fail banking. Um, Positive Money estimates that these policies would allow us to add an additional 50 billion a year over about 20 years, um, which could obviously be used for government sector spending, allow us to pay for society, uh, pay for the things society needs, but without increasing private sector debt. Um, and in shrinking the levels of debt across the economy, then we would see these policies uh, freeing governments from the race for endless economic growth. And instead of uh, sleepwalking into a debt fueled dystopia, it's not too late to switch our money and banking systems to one that paves the way uh, to a more sustainable future. Thanks, Fran. I just um, might take uh, Chair's privilege and just ask a quick question. Yeah. It just struck me when you were talking about debt there, obviously we've had a lot of conversations about government debt in recent years, yeah. um, and many of us um, see some of the arguments around the need for those cuts um, to be more ideological. Um, what does this analysis tell us about, sh I mean, should we be aiming to cut debt in order to lower growth dependencies? Is that, in a sense, a good thing? Yeah, I mean, we've always said the focus on public debt is ridiculous, and what is really worrying in the economy is private debt. And obviously, if you cut public spending at a time of recession, that will deepen the recession, and um, you know that's what we've seen. We've seen the, the growth that we've had since the crash being completely dependent on increasing consumer borrowing, getting people into more and more private debt. So I think you know most economists agree austerity is a mistake, and the focus of it is kind of ridiculous, especially at a time that <coughs> government um, the interest rates are at an all-time low. But I think our analysis kind of takes it on um, a step and says, well, also we don't want to be 
uh, as, as a kind of nation state, we don't want to be beholden to financial markets who are fixated on this growth uh, number and will kind of give us uh, interest rate on our government borrowing dependent on how we're doing on growth. We do need to kind of free ourselves from that. And one way is to bring in this new source of money creation through um, monetary financing. Kate, so Kate Raworth, um, who you all know, uh, probably she wrote the book Zone Art Economics that came out last year, um, was a bit of Christmas reading for me. Um, she's the Senior Visiting Research associate, uh, associate at the Oxford University's Environmental Climate Change Institute. Um, you're going to give us a bit more insight into this growth dependency that we have and potentially what we can do about it. Okay, let's try <laughs> Hi, thank you. I'm very delighted to be here. And I think the very fact that we're having a discussion, a meeting here in this building on a report that's called Escaping Growth Dependency is an impressive and important thing. It's important that these conversations happen because they're difficult conversations. So congratulations to Positive Money for bringing it here and, and opening up this space. And I deeply respect MPs as well who are willing to come and sit at this table because it's uncomfortable. And it's moving away from the easy place. It's much easier to go with the mainstream. And I really respect anyone who's willing to step out and go into this more uncertain place of the future we're trying to create. So the question is, why do we still talk all the time about GDP growth? And is it coming or not? Is it downgraded or not? Everybody knows it's not a good measure. David Cameron, many years ago, said, let's talk about gross national happiness instead. The Guardian agrees. The Financial Times, the World Bank, the, the Economist, you can find articles in all of these papers saying, of course GDP is not a good measure of our progress, so why on earth is it still so central to political and economic debate? I think it's because it's not the measure that matters, it's because our economies are structurally dependent upon unending growth. Our society, too, accepts this quite easily, because deep within a Western culture, there's a metaphor that growth is good. I want my children to grow. I like to see my garden grow, you know? We, like, we think forward and up is good. Why are you looking so down? That's bad. We're moving onwards and upwards. So there's a deep culture in the West of forwards and up, of growth is a good thing, which is, I think, why it's so easily accepted that a book that was written in 1960 has defined the metaphor by which we construct and run our economies. And it's such a wonderful, a powerful book by W. W. Rostow. Uh, I got myself a first edition copy. It's called The Stages of Economic Growth, a Non-Communist Manifesto. <laughs> so, you, so you can smell the politics already. And Rostow said that every economy goes through five stages of growth on its journey to progress. And it, I'm going to just show you right now. It's a little airplane ride. So I'm going to hold my little airplane here. Unless Jonathan feels like holding it. Would you fly that plane? Brilliant. Okay. So here we go. I knew you'd be game. Okay. So um, here we go. You have to go the other direction for them. The growth curve going up. Okay. So in the first, for the first stage is traditional society, in which nothing very much is really happening. You've got traditional agriculture, traditional textiles. Then you get the preconditions for takeoff. We're on the runway now. I'm starting to go. Okay. Preconditions for takeoff, in which Rosto says the idea spreads not merely that economic progress is possible but that economic progress is a necessary condition for some other purpose judged to be good, be it national dignity, private profit, general welfare, or a better life for the children. You get the beginnings of a banking industry, you get education set for work, you get mechanisation, and then therefore we get through to the third stage, which is take off itself. Here we go, here we go, take off. <laughs> Where growth, be you've got to fly, that's it, get off. Growth becomes the normal condition and compound interest becomes built, as it were, into its habits and institutional structure. Both the basic structure of the economy and the social and political structure of the society are transformed in such a way that a steady rate of growth can thereafter regularly be sustained. From there, we go through the fourth phase, where goes the drive to maturity. That's it, we're going up now. Drive to maturity, where you can have any industry you want, no matter what your natural resource base. And then we go to the fifth and final stage, way up there we go, thank you, Jonathan, where we have the era of high mass consumption, where people can buy any goods and services they want. Rostow said, like, bicycles and sewing machines, this was 1960. Okay, so, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point. 
because this airplane ride, unlike any other airplane, cannot be allowed to land. See, in 1960, Rostow left us flying off into the sunset of mass consumerism. And actually, he knew it. I won't give you one, mate. You can bring it down in a minute. Just not yet. He <laughs> said, and then the question beyond, where history offers us only fragments, what to do when the increase in real income itself loses its charm? You see, he asked that question, but he never answered it. And here's why. Rostow was about to be an advisor to presidential candidate John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy was standing for election in 1960 on the promise of a 5% growth rate. So Rostow's job was to keep that plane flying, not to ask if, how, and when it could ever be allowed to land. <laughs> so he left us flying off into the sunset of mass consumerism. And while we're there, we could probably sit and realize that actually we have another relationship to the metaphor of growth. Because it's not just that we want our children to grow and our gardens to grow. If I tell you that my friend went to the doctor and he told her she had a growth, now that feels very, very different because we instinctively know that when something is trying to grow within a healthy, living, dynamic, delicately balanced system, that doesn't bode well. And if it's unchecked, it can damage and destroy the very system on which it depends. So... Here we are, flying, 60 years later, after Rostow, off into the sunset of mass consumerism. Rostow wrote his book before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, realising the damage of pesticides to wildlife in the fields. He wrote it long before climate change was really widely understood. He wrote it long before we had an international agreement to tackle climate change. Ours is a completely different era, and we need to move into a different phase of understanding our relationship to growth. So the obvious question is, well, if we're not for growth is the first thing, what are we for? I'd say we're for thriving, for an economy that allows us to thrive, because the economy we have, driven by this need for endless growth, I believe in the UK and many other countries, has become deeply divisive. As Franz said, the rise of the millionaire, the rise of the 1%, and the rise of food banks. It's also become deeply degenerative. We know that the structures of our economy are among those countries that are running down the systems of the living world on which we depend. So we want to get away from a divisive economy towards one that's distributive of value that's created, shared far more equitably with everybody. We want to see a closing down of tax havens and an opening up of children's centres. We want to see an economy in which everybody is benefiting from the way that economic value is created. We also want to move from a degenerative economy to a regenerative one, where we stop fracking underground for all sources of oil and energy and gas, and we start looking up for our energy, from the sun, from the wind, because that's the future of renewable energy. Now, what's going to happen as we move this incredible transition towards an economy that's far more distributive and is regenerative of the living world? Some things need to grow and some things need to die. And we need to have the ability for GDP, which is merely the value of goods and services sold in the economy, to be able to respond to that transition. But we can't do it if we're locked structurally into having an ever-rising GDP. Because we do, as Fran said, have structural lock-ins to this growth. Financially, through the system where we create money through commercial banks, bearing debt, through the finance system that drives to that high rate of return, forcing companies, if they want to keep their shareholders, to have ever-growing profits. We're politically locked in. You know, the, every government wants higher tax revenue without higher tax rates. Well, the way to get that is have a growing GDP. But also, no government wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if you don't have a growing economy, you're going to be booted out by the next emerging powerhouse. And we're socially locked in, because after a century of consumerist propaganda telling us that we improve ourselves by buying something more, we now seem to have in the UK no celebration at all of Thanksgiving, but we have the day after called Black Friday, where everybody goes out and spends money like crazy. And these are cultural lock-ins to the idea that we need ever-rising income for a better life. I believe we are like the pilots in that plane that have been left flying forever into the sunset, and we, as a generation, knowing what we now know, we have to write the chapters that are missing in the flight manual. We have to write the chapters that allow us to get out of a plane that has to rise and fly forever. And that's what meetings like this are for. That's what reports like this are for, beginning to take on the tricky questions. How on earth do we get out of this growth dependency? It's not going to be easy, and these aren't comfortable questions. But if we don't start addressing them now and recognising the un resolved challenges that are at the heart of the economic structures we have, 
we stand very little chance of thriving. See how urgent it is, you know? <laughs> Even the bells are ringing. So, I'm delighted <coughs> to be part of this discussion. I'm delighted that there are politicians brave enough and open-minded enough to take on these questions because we need the entire House of Commons and the House of Lords to be stepping up to this if we are indeed going to thrive together in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kate. Well, we're all awake now. Um, I would say, I mean, we are very lucky today to have uh, three politicians from across the political spectrum to talk about this. And that is, that is very important. Like you say, everyone needs to be taking this issue very seriously. And it's not sort of big P political, um, necessarily. Um, I'm going to start with Kevin Hollingrake, who is the Conservative MP for Thirsk and Moulton since 2015. Um, and also sits on the Communities and Local Government Committee. Uh, do you want to kick us off? Yes, I'd like, I'd like to thank you very much. And um, thanks, Rosa. And uh, wonderful to follow that wonderful presentation from Kate. Um, talks about brave politicians. Brave isn't a word politicians are too comfortable with. It usually means you're in the wrong place saying the wrong things. But um, I did. I was quite interested in the narrative leading up to, the, to this um, event, which he said, um, I think this would bring together leading thinkers and also politicians. <laughs> so. Um, so uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm a, um, a business person more than an economist, but um, in terms of uh, so 25 years in business before starting in politics in 2015, quite an interesting time to start, you might say. But, um, but I'm also a chair of the all-party parliamentary group for poverty. So and I absolutely believe, despite the fact you might say I'm a conservative politician, I absolutely believe we should be looking for a fairer society. So a lot of the things we're talking about today I absolutely resonate with me. Well, if I talk to my children, my four children, especially the oldest ones, I, I don't talk to about them about going out and making lots of money. Um, I talk to them about having a happy life. You know, that's the, by far the most important thing for all of us. So, and I too remember David Cameron's uh, um, happiness index, and I was, you know, absolutely a big fan of that. So, um, so yes, I, I agree we've got a problem in terms of debt and whether it's GDP we should be using as a measure or something else, but debt no doubt about it. I mean, governments of all persuasions, I think the last, by the time we get to a position where we're breaking even in the UK in terms of government uh, and public spending, if we get to that point in time, which is in the early 2020s, I think that would, th of the last 35 years, five years we will have broken even. And that we're, by that time we'll be two trillion pounds in debt. So, um, and, and also, of course, household debt is on the rise too. 1.63 billion, I think, by 2016 in terms of household debt. 80% of that is mortgage debt, but rising debt also for students and for con consumer debt. So we absolutely have got some problems. I don't believe debt is good, whether it's public sector or private sector, personally. And on top of that, it's going to get worse. If you think where we are today in terms of our public spending versus 60 years ago, we were spending a hundred, um, it is really urgent all this, isn't it? You're quite right A hundred billion a year in terms of public spending 60 years ago, we're now spending 780 billion pounds a year in public spending. But the dynamics, the demographics are going to have some real time bombs in there, particularly around uh, the fact there's more of us, that we're living longer, which is really good news, but that's putting huge pressure on the system. In terms of um, back 60 years ago, 11% of our spending went on, on social spending, social security spending, that includes welfare and pensions. Today it is 28%, 45% of which is pensions. It, back 60 years ago, 7% of our, of our spending was on healthcare. Today it's 18%. And we absolutely know those things are going to get much, uh, they're going to be some much greater challenges in those areas. So our public spending is going to grow and grow and grow. And we need to find a way to manage that public spending whilst not getting the government and, and effectively the taxpayer into deeper debt. So I guess the question is, is there a single solution to those problems? I think Fran was saying there is in terms of this, uh, this, um, this new approach to the economy. I say I'm not an economist, so... Um, but I have reservations about that. Um, printing money effectively um, hasn't work in, worked in the past. You can look at many examples around the world of where that has gone horribly wrong. And, and so to me, that is very risky. 
Um, for me, to do that, and I may have this wrong, but it misunderstands what money is. Money is simply, as I understand it, a, an aggregation of all the goods and services on the planet. So simply to print more in, in, in the fact we're good, on, on the basis that we're going to increase those goods and services isn't sound uh, um, economics, in my view. And I think there was that old Native American proverb as well, it's the last tree, it's only when the last tree is cut down, the last fish has been eaten, the last stream has been polluted that we realise we can't eat money. We need to be able to find ways of sustainable growth. And I absolutely believe that should be the case. I don't also, also believe that governments are driving GDP. They may use that as a measure, but for me, people drive GDP. People's uh, ambition, uh, whether it's their, whether it's for their, um, uh, per, their personal uh, gain or whether it's in terms of, in terms of what, where they see the opportunities in their lives. I'm not saying everybody should go on that path, but people naturally do want to get on. People naturally are optimistic and want to, want to have purpose in their lives, and that might include growing their personal economy, which grows the wider economy. So, um, so certainly, um, you may say GDP is actually a measure of government interference. Um, you see in the USA, I'm not recommending this as a strategy, but the way, the way they're trying to increase GDP is deregulating the economy. So businesses and individuals can get on and take those opportunities to grow that economy. So I'm not sure it's the government that's driving all this. Like, naturally, people are. And one thing I think we should realise about where we are today more than ever is that people are in charge. If anything, Brexit will, will, can tell you, and there's probably not a lot of people in this room that voted for Brexit, I didn't, but um, that people are in charge. So governments respond to what people desire, what people want. It may take more time than we might naturally, uh, uh, that we'd, we'd like that to happen more quickly, but I think people are the, are the, are the driving seat in this particular argument. I think the other thing I would say, a little bit more positive in terms of where we are today, if you compare where we are today on the planet versus 100 years ago, there's been some enormous successes, many of which as a result of economic growth. 100 years ago, 94% of people on this planet were in extreme poverty. Now there are 10%. No, not percent of people got a vaccination, now 86%. And child mortality, and that must be one of the uh, measures we should look at in terms of, in terms of uh, our society, was 43%. That's children dying under five years old, now only 4%. So there are some positives as well as some of the difficulties we, we see. So, um, so how, we, how we try and deal with these problems, I think there's three different areas we try and deal with. We've got to try and develop a system where the government does balance its, its books, despite the pressures that are coming down the line. In terms of household debt, certainly in terms of uh, higher wages, lower direct taxes, more truly affordable homes. I think one, if you look at that figure in terms of personal debt, 80% of the personal debt is mortgage debt. Certainly in terms of making sure we more fairly share the value of land between the individuals who own the land and the wider community. We have definitely got that wrong at the moment, no question. And it, in terms of the other point, in terms of environmental degradation, that comes back to regulation. And I absolutely believe we should be regulating further. You see with the direction of travel to this government, whether it's in terms of more investment in renewables, 13 renewable energy records broken this year, um, there are some significant progresses on, on the lines that Kate was talking about in terms of using the wind, using solar. We've got to live with the planet. And, uh, and also the PPS to Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary. And I think he's absolutely committed to make sure our future growth is sustainable. And I don't think those two things are incompatible, growth and, and, and sustainability. So, yes, we've got challenges. We probably disagree slightly with the solutions but we've got to work to the same end of finding those solutions. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, we'll, I'll let Fran and, and Kate come back on some of those points towards the end, and I want to make sure I give time for people in the audience to ask questions as well. Um, Alex Sobel is the Labour MP for Leeds North West. He was elected last year. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> He was previously the Deputy Executive Member for the Climate Change on Leeds City Council. Um, I think there's a real 
point there about what we do about debt, obviously in the Labour Manifesto um, there was discussion about debt in order to invest in infrastructure. Um, it'd be great if you could pick that up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Fadia. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to, because the person that probably wrote that section of the manifesto is here, so mm. I'm not, not going to cut across him. Um, I was going to really try and relate some of the macroeconomic points that, that Fran made and, and Kate made to an extent to, to re the real world scenario we're in and where we are at this point in history. And I think we are at a real turning point in history for a number of reasons, one of which is the challenge around climate change, is the challenge around the heating of the planet and the depletion of resources. And I'm sure Jonathan might touch on that after me, and I hope not to steal all his lines. And the other one is actually around technology and both the empowering nature of technology, but also the disempowering nature of technology if used for the wrong reasons and the wrong, um, wrong hands. Um, and we have this... this probably short, quite short period in the history of humanity and of the planet to, to change the models and to change the metrics. And if we don't do that, then future generations won't thank us because it will be unclear what sort of planet we're going to leave and what sort of lives they're going to be able to lead with the planet we're going to bequeath them. So it's quite important that we actually change the conversation and change the game I mean, this, this is an important point, as, as, as we were, particularly in this country, when we left feudalism, went into the Reformation, and then moved th through that to the Industrial Revolution. This is just an, as important a time as that. More important, I'd say, than the post-war settlement, um, the formation of the Bretton Woods, and actually the, 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 the economic model that, that we've been working on the last 70 or so years. Um, I think the last few years, since 2010, two, two things have arisen um, which are helpful um, to try and create the new model. Um, one of which is the sharing economy, and they say necessity is the mother of invention. I think that is where the sharing economies come from. So people are empowered through the use of technology to be able to share rather than to buy new to, to, um, to throw away so people can use that technology to find others who want the things that they have. But we, this does not you know, contribute to GDP or to economic growth. Um, and actually, we need to be thinking much more about share. And you know, I, I probably, maybe now I'm going to sound a little bit like a conservative, but make do and mend. Um, and the use that people can make of those rather than have the throwaway culture of just buying new. Well, it's not working today, I'm going to throw it away and just buy a new one. Um, and the other um, point, which is a bit more complex, is around the circular economy. I met with the chair of the Resource Association yesterday. The biggest problem we face in this country, less so <coughs> than other European countries, is um, the quality and value, I'm not going to use the word cost, value of um, recyclable materials. And actually, this is the big barrier for us to um, move away from um, things being made from virgin materials, which are a great cost of the planet, to, to recycling and, re and uh, uh, those materials. Um, the, the, our economy isn't set up to create good quality recyclable materials and then to process them and then to create new products from those. And we need to have much more investment, much more quickly, in, in, in recycling plants. And also we need to, particularly around plastics, we need to reduce the number of different types of polymers that are allowed to be created in this country and sold. And then we'd quickly move into circular economy model. This would have a break on traditional GDP growth because you don't get the same amount of growth from those recyclable materials than you do from virgin materials. But without that movement, we are going to, you know, everybody's, well, not everybody, I haven't actually seen Blue Planet. I'll keep going, but everybody's seen Blue Planet. I've never actually seen it. I've just heard about it and read about it. But everybody else seems to have seen it. So, but, you know, the, the story there are around plastics in the ocean, I will at some point get around to watching it when I've recessed and time to do things like that. Um, and 
what and you know, and then the the other drivers around, what you know, we're seeing com- big the big corporations profit margins are continually growing, and you know, what does that contribute? So we see GDP growth mm-hmm. go up, we see private debt go up because it's you know it's being fueled. People are buying more products. Those corporations' profit margins are increasing, and what are they doing with it? Is it, is it going to increase um, wages? Well, yes, it is for a few, but not for the majority of their workforce. Is it going to support their supply chain in um, new technology or increasing their, you know, their wage forces, uh, pay packets? No. Is it going to R&D? Not, not really, not in any significant way, only to move to the next model. So the top 50 US companies have currently... Um, 1.4 trillion dollars, or about billion, um, sorry, a billion, sorry, a trillion pounds in reserves offshore in tax havens. So this is money that can't be touched by the US government. I don't know what it is for UK, but it will be obviously a smaller amount. But similar issue here, and we've seen all the evidence in the well, not all, some of the evidence in the Paradise Papers. The largest single company's um, cash reserves are apples. And so, although I have an iPhone, I'm an Apple user, I'm a fool, and so is Parliament because they give us all iPads. Um, their cash reserve offshore currently is just short of $200 billion. Their total cash reserve is about $225 billion. They won't bring their cash reserves onshore. They're not, they're not spending their cash reserves and improving their supply chain. You hear all the stories around their factories. They're not spending it on... Um, you know, we, you know, for instance, data centers are huge um, energy, uh, you know, use a huge amount of energy. Are they using those to, to, to spend on data centers and the data centers they use and the data they hold use in terms of um, renewable energy? No, they're not. You know, um, we're seeing a huge growth. I'm not going to get into this, but in cryptocurrencies. And the biggest problem with cryptocurrencies is the currency mining and the huge amount of energy use. Um, the... Energy use of currency in the UK is currently about the same as the city of Coventry uses for all its energy needs, and that's cryptocurrency mining. So we're seeing a huge alternative use of, of energy and resources and offshoring at the expense of our economy. So we need different metrics, we need a different model. And I'm really glad that, that, although I haven't talked about Positive Money's report, Positive Money are bringing forward different macroeconomic solutions for those <coughs> challenges. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, Jonathan Bartley, the co-leader of the Green Party. Slight crack. So I, I like to think that maybe I am a bit of a poor politician, but maybe that's because I'm not elected. <laughs> um, I just discovered that I was, uh, I just found out that I was dragged away by police uh, the other day at a fracking site, uh, Kate, uh, in Kevin's constituency. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my link. Um, I don't want to repeat a lot of what's been said. I am very much in Kate's camp. We met uh, a few weeks ago and we were chatting through uh, and looking at how we need to create new metaphors, new ideas, new images for how we make this transition. Um, when I was a, a child, I remember being told that in 30, 40 years' time, there'll be all this technological advance, there'll be all this wealth creation. We'll be able to work fewer hours. Uh, we'll all have that safety and security we get from a modern state, welfare state, we'll go on developing, that there will be the health breakthroughs in the NHS, and we'll get the basic health care that we needed. Um, and of course, that wealth has been created. Uh, that technological advance has happened. But what we see instead is growing inequality, with wealth flowing to the owners of capital, uh, wages stagnating, a whole decade, a lost decade now, following the financial uh, catastrophe, the collapse that we saw, and we're still kind of recovering from. Um, fast forward a little bit to my A-levels, and I started to study A-level economics, and I was shown the uh, circular flow of income uh, with the injectors and the withdrawals from the circular uh, flow, and we were taught this is how it is. We were taught this as fact uh, rather than value. And then went to the London School of Economics, and I decided to study, and actually I would realise suddenly, actually, you know what, there are alternative perspectives on this. This isn't just fact. But we have, nevertheless, an economy that's based on that A-level economic model, uh, which is increasingly tested and increasingly found wanting. I then went to work in the House of Commons in the early 1990s, and I remember about 94, I got a, a letter across my desk from a guy called George Dent at, at Keele University. He said, I've got this great idea. How about we cancel debt in the developing world in the year 2000? Let's have a jubilee. I nearly fell off my chair laughing. <laughs> I thought, this is never going to happen. No one's talking about this. None of the parties were 
referendum. This was a new idea that no one was talking about. Six years later, the G8 was sitting around saying not uh, can we cancel debt in the developing world, but which country's debt are we going to cancel? Such was a huge paradigm shift. Uh, we can cancel debt, uh, we can liberate ourselves from this economic system, and we can think in new ways. And I'm very excited because we can get that changed very, very swiftly and very, very quickly. And that's kind of what I want to talk about, what we need to do to liberate ourselves, to move towards uh, the kind of ideas that positive money can talk about. The Green Party have been banging on about these things for decades. Um, but now I think we are seeing something change. People are waking up to the fact it's common sense that we've had all this wealth created, this technological advance, but we aren't seeing the benefits. And meanwhile, we are ravaging the planet, we are destroying the planet, and we cannot go on like this. It isn't sustainable. Um, I think it's particularly timely seeing what's going on with Carillion at the moment, uh, that we're having this meeting right now. Carillion and what's going on there is the product of this economic system, this uh, neoliberal system to which we are wedded. Just this morning, the National Audit Office came out uh, pointing out that it's going to be something like £200 billion more we're going to pay because of the private finance initiative. A few days before, we had uh, the assessment of the government's <coughs> clean growth plan, uh, which we now know will not hit uh, the fourth and fifth carbon budgets to which we are signed up to under the Paris Agreement. We are not on course uh, to do those things. We, have, we need a complete paradigm shift. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? And positive money in their report are starting to uh, hint at some of the ways we can do it with their uh, proposals around the money supply and <coughs> money. But I want to suggest some, some other ways as well. Perhaps talking about metaphors, uh, I know Kate works with the idea of the garden, and I think that's a wonderful metaphor uh, to work with. Uh, another one is perhaps to look at the, the economic pie. We don't just need to divide up uh, the economic pie more fairly. Uh, the pie is frankly past its uh, sell-by date and it is stale. <laughs> we need to bake a new pie with new ingredients. Uh, it's that kind of paradigm shift that we need to be talking about. So what are the kind of ideas? We need to be thinking about a basic income. Uh, we need to think about that, that, you know, that promise of the safety net that we were all told we have to stop this pursuit of sanctions uh, and trying to divide society against deserving and undeserving, but move beyond that with the growth of technology. Uh, and I've used that G word, growth. You know, the fact that we don't have growth doesn't mean that we don't have technological advance, and I want to nail that. Uh, right now, we can go on and have any technological advance uh, without being wedded to that blind allegiance growth. So let's use that technological advance, uh, share out the wealth more evenly, and let's have that basic income. How do we uh, live our lives? Let's look at the four-day week, the working week. You know, Henry Ford made the shift from the six-day week to the five-day week 100 years ago. Everyone felt, told him he was crazy. Now that's a uh, common practice. I was at Orms Ormston Wire, uh, which is a company out in the East End uh, a few months ago. But they've been running a four-day week uh, through three recessions. And it's uh, still them in wonderful stead because they are investing in their employees, they have a great morale within the company, the company works together on a cooperative uh, basis. Uh, and you know, it works. So let's think about uh, how we can look at the hours of work and why we work. Let's ask those fundamental questions um, about who the economy is for. That is the most powerful question that we can ask right now. Who is the economy for, not how much can we grow the economy. Let's look. Uh, as Alex said, at the certainty of economy, but let's look at uh, the taxation. Uh, VAT, why do we levy a, virtually a flat rate uh, of VAT? Why are we not giving subsidies to those things which are good, which are renewable, which are recyclable, recyclable, and then disincentivizing through increased uh, taxation those that aren't? Uh, it makes financial sense. It could be even revenue neutral. It doesn't even have to cost money if you incentivize those things that are good, you incentivize those things that are bad. Practically speaking, those are the big ideas. Smaller ideas, I think we need to challenge uh, very seriously HS2. What a monumental waste of money uh, that is going to put us more into debt. Uh, it's going to shave off a few minutes uh, from a line from uh, Birmingham down to London in travel. Why are we not investing in local transport infrastructure? Getting you know, Southern Rail, where I live. Wouldn't it be great to get Southern Rail working well? <laughs> Southern Rail. Uh, let's invest in the local transport infrastructure, which will help to develop those local circular economies. Heathrow expansion is in the news this morning again. Uh, they're going to fill car park with 40,000 cars under Heathrow. Let's instead look at how we reduce uh, flying demand with a frequent flyer levy. We know that the overwhelming majority of flights are taken by about 15% uh, of the people. Let's impose that frequent fly levy. Let's use that technology so we don't have to be traveling all over the world all the time and reduce demand. Um, we can think too about uh, fossil fuels and fracking. I mentioned that I was uh, dragged away. It is inconceivable uh, that we should be 
opening up another fossil fuel industry, which actually isn't particularly financially viable, that will be subsidised uh, more by the taxpayer, that will pollute our air, that will uh, damage the natural world, and will uh, further undermine our efforts to meet uh, our climate change commitments under the Paris Agreement. And why are we sinking £35 billion pounds into uh, Hinkley? Uh, a white elephant that will lock us into a deal for 10, 20, 30 years to come, which is already more expensive than offshore wind. It is absolutely absurd. It makes us vulnerable uh, to foreign interests. It makes us vulnerable in terms of our own national security. It is a bad deal. We do not need it. Uh, there's a growing consensus, but why are we uh, investing all that money in creating so few jobs? We should have a <coughs> centralised energy system which would hand power back to the communities. Uh, and give them control of the energy supply, again, creating those res resilient local economies. So there is so much that we can do both in very tangible, specific uh, projects and measures and alternatives, making the right choices, and there are the big uh, macroeconomic issues about how we transition the economy to something that's more sustainable, which we also uh, need to look at. And underpinning all that, I think we need to boldly start to talk in new language and explore uh, the way that we can use new metaphors. You know that, I remember, I'm finishing now, I remember on uh, question time, just after the financial crisis, uh, a conservative, this isn't a private political figure, it's just a, a, a fact, a conservative came on and said, um, you know what, uh, this is all about, it's not really about the bankers, uh, it's about the fact that the last Labour government overspent. And the whole audience cracked up laughing and mocked that Tory MP. The next week, another Tory MP came on and said the same thing. The week after, another Tory MP came on and said the same thing. And within a year, two years, it somehow became the received wisdom that the whole mess that we were in was because the Labour government had overspent rather than there had been a financial catastrophe and a banking crisis. And then we had the metaphor of the credit card, you know, which you prod it and it just falls apart. You know, the household uh, uh, debt uh, that we can't afford to maintain any longer, and that became common parlance. We need to develop alternative metaphors, alternative ways looking at the economy and the world uh, and, and actually take hold of that discourse and I hope that this report is a very bold step and an important step uh, towards doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you to our five speakers for really giving us this, kind of the scale of the challenge here. I want to open up to questions now. Um, I would ask for questions and, and not long comments. Um, I'm going to be reading cut in if, if I get long comments um, and I want to ensure a gender balance. Um, can we start here? of the policy proposals in the report, so I guess I wanted to bring the discussion back to that. I think that the analysis um, <coughs> that the current monetary system is creating excess credit for the wrong things to happen in financial intermediation is right, and we're getting this pro-cyclical instability as a result in high levels of debt, which I agree do create uh, a growth dependency. But um, I'm a bit puzzled why um, there's, you know, there's the, so much time and energy going into campaigning for taking the power of money creation entirely away from banks, given that banks had that power of money creation and we didn't see the boom bust um, patterns for several decades before the takeoff of neoliberalism. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of puzzled why there isn't more discussion of credit, uh, you know, uh, credit with credit controls or risk risk weighting um, capital adequacy ratios, which, you know, discourage banks from high levels of mortgage lending and, and so on. I'll, I'll try to respond yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm really interested in more unpacking of how we can, rather than have a revolution, sort of boil the frog without it being sort of too fussed uh, <laughs> in, in small steps. I was listening to um, mm -hmm. Brown talking about the you know, sovereign uh, money system. I'm not sure whether that was 50 billion a year or 50 billion over 50 years. Either way, I wonder whether that is enough. Obviously, there's a whole issue of uh, whether um, sustainable economic growth is an oxymoron or not. Uh, arguably, you can uh, say we're interested in a greater growth in efficiency. We all know that with Moore's Law, uh, computers over a period of four years are worth uh, half as much for twice the power, and that is an actual negative on GDP. And Moore's law, or something similar to it, is operating in a whole uh, raft of other technology.
approaches. So again, if you st if you stop talking about ending growth dependency, so to offering the metrics, what can we do along those lines? Also, in terms of bringing it along, maybe we should show more concern for the welfare of the one percent. You know, workers and pickets show that they live longer when there's more equality. And and she was saying that one, one of one of the hedge fund managers was saying that the other way. So okay, I'll thank you. Uh, yes, this lady here. Hi, I'm Bob Jacobson from Disc Income UK. Thank you, Jonathan, for mentioning this. Uh, because one of the things that's really uh, bothered me over the last 30 years, I used to be involved in a campaign to get women's work counted, at the unpaid work counted in the GDP. Uh, so this issue of GDP and what it means and stuff has been quite a kind of slightly nerdy obsession of mine for a long time. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm sort of most concerned about are the extra, you know, what we call externalities. All right, I've been very much involved with. Uh, one of the reasons I support based income is because we need to, you know, I think I feel society really needs to support what's known as an externality, which is looking after each other. Uh, and you know, that's I mean more than automation. I'm actually much more worried about the fact that the growth in jobs has largely been in in. Um, in activities which, which protect either property or keep other people from, from getting access to money. And it just seems very clear to me that, that GDP kind of looks at the planet as a kind of infinite growth mechanism, and whereas money, which is something that, that humans have invented, and we So what, sorry, what's the question? Sorry, I'll, I'll get there, sorry. Um, just to know, you know, that money is something that, that we get that, um, you know, we've invented it, so therefore we could have limitless, you know, we don't have to constantly like, keep each other from it, basically. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering with the report, I, I really welcome it and I look forward to reading it. I mean, how does, how do people think about these externalities, whether that's in terms of the unpaid work that goes into the economy, or whether it's also, I, you know, these, okay, these sorry. items and stuff are, they're using huge amounts of, of material which, which we don't really kind of recognize. Okay, I will come back for another round. I know there's people with them um, hand, with hands up, but we'll, let me just come back for the panel and I'll, we'll do another round. Um, Fran, do you want to pick up some of those points yeah, about the policy sure. proposals? Yeah, and I just want to say, like, I don't think it's a surprise that, um, you know, that we've just had three long, very interesting comments from an audience, you know, talking about this uh, topic. Like, it's difficult, like, you're here because you're interested in the hard questions and on a 9 a.m. And, and, uh, in January on a grey day talking about you know some of the hardest questions I think we face in society um, right now. So I think they, for me, just speak that it's complex. And I think at Positive Money, the way I tried to lead the organisation is that we don't claim to have all of the answers, but we have some of the questions. And that's always a good place to start. I think somebody said that once and I thought it was quite good. Um, so. Uh, just to kind of pick up on a few things like first I do want to come back to Kevin's point I think that the focus on on public debt and balancing books is wrong and I and I agree with the conversation that basically says that you know it was the failure to reform the financial crisis which allowed the conversation to morph into that of public spending and government debt and actually we're still there now we still have a financial system which is you know threatens uh, us to kind of go into another uh, catastro catastrophic crash. We've seen Carillion and, and what's happening there. It's an unstable system with huge mountains of debt. Uh, and um, I, just to kind of pick up on a few points that um, that Beth made, I mean, as an organization, we haven't, we've kind of shifted away from campaigning for a sovereign money system because we see it as a complex system change. And we've looked at campaigning on some of its component parts. So for example, criticizing current monetary policy, saying the 70 billion that was created as a response to Brexit through QE, 10 billion of which was buying corporate bonds, which actually was quite a lot in fossil fuel companies, <coughs> actually is ridiculous. We're seven years since the crash, economic thinking has moved on, and we don't need to be using the same policies we know just boost stock markets, increase liquidity, but do nothing for the uh, actual economic system we've had. Um, but I would actually come back to you and say that, uh, you know, there are things to look at like risk weighting, etc. But actually, if you look at the uh, the instability in the system, it is a systemic issue. Like it's, you know, the, the shadow banking system, the repo market, all of this can't be fixed 
by regulation in its current form. It actually does need to have a, a kind of system approach to it, which understands with each piece of regulation you're putting forward, you might be adding complexity into a system that is inherently unstable and unfair. Um, so I, I just think that there's no straightforward answers and we have to start somewhere. And I think like understanding that we can uh, have a new conversation around what we measure how we measure success in the economy and actually what is money, which you know, is more of a philosophical question than anything else, then um, we might start to get somewhere and at least be quite open-minded about how we, um, how we kind of take uh, thinking forward. And I think it's important to kind of keep the conversation at its highest level because we don't, have any, uh, the, uh, like we don't all have the answers yet and we need to um, kind of bring people in, whether their specific focus is basic income or technological innovation, um, rather than think there's some kind of one simple solution. So Positive Money in this report has tried to focus on bringing back onto the table the conversation that we really do have a problem with GDP growth, and like we need to talk about that, and it's uncomfortable. Um, and we have obviously focused in on um, the way that the system relies on uh, high levels of debt just to keep itself going and try and open that up. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. Can I ask Kate if you can, pick, if you can pick up some of those points, some of the questions raised, which are a lot about what we do now. Um, given that you've been looking at this issue for a long time, you know, what are the first steps? Like Jonathan mentioned some of the policies that we might, we might push for. Um, what, where do you think we should be starting on this? Um, I agree with some of the, the policies that Jonathan mentioned, especially shifting, for example, in business, taxing businesses for hiring people. Hiring people is a great thing. Why do we, ta why do we penalize companies for hiring people? And yet they get subsidized for using materials like uh, you know, capital depreciation. It's completely the wrong way around. So we should shift taxes from labor to virgin material use, which would, as Alex said, start building the logic and infrastructure of a circular economy. But I want to pick up on the point I think Barbara Jacobson made about she said, uh, humans invented money. In fact, we designed money. And it was a real revelation for me to think about design of money, design of so many of these institutions the economy. I do think of the economy as a, a like a garden. It's an organic, ever-evolving system. We don't control it. As, as Kevin said, it, people are making the economy evolve. It's evolving. But we can shape it. And, and the institutions we create design it. And that's why I think it's great Positive Money's written this report. How do we design money? And when I, I studied economics for four years at university, I was never invited to think about the fact that money was designed and that had consequences. But I've got in my pocket six kinds of currency that can be used in this country, and they're all designed in different ways. See, every currency has three design features you want to ask yourself. Who has the power to create it? What characters it have? And what can it be used for? So here we go. I, I will be brief. First one, first, most kids make first currency, they meet is the gold star. Yeah. If you pee in your potty, do your homework, practice the piano, eat your greens, you get a gold star, and at the end of the week, if you get five gold stars, we might, I don't know, go to the shop. And, right? So most kids meet this currency first. Whether it's a good thing or not, any parent in the room knows that can go badly wrong. I offered my daughter a gold star for peeing on the potty. She just did six little wees and said six, six stars. <laughs> so that, that was out immediately. But then there's, there's the one we all know, the fiver, issued by the state. If I put it under my pillow, it just remains five pounds, but it gets eroded by inflation. <coughs> so the state issues it, and it can be used to buy goods and services any, in any retail shop in the UK. Then there's the one that Positive Money is talking about, a credit card, money that's created by the commercial bank at debt-bearing interest, and that can drive growth, because I need to then earn more money to repay that interest. Um, and what can it be used for, right? And often, it's, as we know, the, often issued for, for mortgages, which is creating a bubble. Then we've got, oh, we've got my boots card. So uh, this is like a free, frequent flyer card. Spend more money with us, and you can spend even more money with us, which, which changes you and makes you spend more likely in boots, and then you buy more things in boots. And any company can issue this kind of card. Now I'm getting down to real stuff. Uh, Bristol, so here's a Bristol pound. Anyone from Bristol with a Bristol pound here? Yeah, there we go. Oh, they're looking very pleased now. Uh, Bristol Pound, you can use this in Bristol in shops that agree to, to, oh. to take part. The mayor of Bristol agreed to take much of his salary in these. You can buy train tickets, you can pay your local taxes. This is helping distribute in the Bristol economy. And then lastly, uh, babysitting circle that I'm part of. We created this. It's worth four, four hours of babysitting. Um, so any kind of currency, who creates it, the character it's given, and what it can be used for, these things shape our behavior. I'm more likely to go out when I can go out for four hours on a card than it costs me 30 quid merely to step out my door and leave my kids. 
I'm more likely to buy things at Boots because I have an advantage card. Um, I'm more likely to overspend if I have a credit card. It shapes our behavior. It also shapes our relationships. I bet the people in Bristol have stronger relationships with small local shopkeepers because of the Bristol pound. It shapes distribution. Who benefits? Because the credit card has very different distributional impacts than the Bristol pound. But it also shapes growth. Because when we write into a currency that is bearing interest, it drives that growth. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, say here which of these is the right currency or which is the right design. I love it that Positive Money are putting out a report advocating a particular design. But importantly, behind that, what it does is make us realize that money is designed. And how it's designed shapes so much. And if it's designed, it means it can be redesigned. And this is one of the most exciting economic design questions we face this century. We have to take it on. Economics is incredibly exciting when you realize it's a question of design. And not many people can get their heads around monetary design because it's very, very complicated. Um, but, and I certainly, I'm coming at it from the outside, but I think it's a really important story that gets opened up so more of us understand where money comes from, how it's designed, and that it can be redesigned. Thank you. I'm going to open up again and then I'll come back to it. <laughs> Sort of his words. <laughs> right, okay. Um, but kind of challenging the idea that not much happens in mm. that, so I'm not suggesting we'll go back to mm. agricultural lifestyles. Um, but how do we subtly change our value system? Mm. Is my question. Mm. The question is this how do you get the change done so that it's not just the pioneers like us that are moving in this direction, but the progressives? And the young. How do we create a movement that persuades the third cut, the emperor's new clothes, and the group thing that we have to make this change? Thank you for keeping that. Okay, so the guy, but I'll take all of the questions that are remaining. Yeah. Uh, which will work. Uh, I guess follow one question. Um, I, as a member of the general public, have the impression that the city of London has an inordinate influence on public policy and how it's shaped, uh, certainly far greater than, than I do as a member of the public. Um, and if that is the case, Somebody did a survey about three years ago asking MPs whether they knew questions about the money system, and they not nearly all of them got it wrong. That was repeated just very recently, and the same proportion got it wrong. So we've done nothing to improve mm -hmm. the knowledge of MPs. How can we help? Great. <laughs> yes. Um, so my question is primarily to Fran. Um, so. Um, so to what extent do you think this is achievable in the unilateral, unilaterally? So I'm just thinking in terms of, um, you know, the fact that as far as climate change is concerned, time is not on our side. And I agree with Jonathan that, you know, we need to change the narrative and the cultural values around it. But to do that in a really short space of time is very difficult. So, you know, if, you know in terms of capital flight, you know, if it's going to be difficult to, to convince people that a steady state economy is one that, the first thing about values, I, I'd take it on and say, do, generally, by and large, across the piece, the people who are um, baby boomers have the same set of values as millennials. I think all of the recent events where people voted, and you look at the age demographic breakdown, suggests that they don't. So if you look at the EU referendum, you know, people around 70, very high numbers, voted to leave, and people around 20, in very high numbers, voted to remain. If you look at the last general election, the same thing around, you know, how people vote, if you vote Conservative, vote Labour, the same thing, you know, older people generally vote Conservative, and younger people generally vote Labour, and I'm only here because of that demographic split. So I'd say that values are changing. Which is a positive thing, and and I think that that the environment, the environment people are operating in, through their lives, shapes that. Um, what 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 we struggle with is how those people can then 
aggregate that to change the, the environment. And that comes to, to movement and movement politics. And I think that, um, we, I mean, you know, in the Labour Party, we're trying to b build that sort of movement politics. We're trying to, to become, um, as well as a political party operating here and on local authorities and in structures, a social movement on the ground, um, operating in communities, which obviously when you're in opposition is much easier to do than in government, so that would be a challenge when we move into government. Um, but I think we're driven by a different set of values. We, we're we not part of, I don't, you know, I certainly don't feel, personally, as a member of the Labour Member Party, I'm part of the neoliberal consensus. I'm proud to be a Labour and cooperative member of Parliament. I believe in there's cooperative, collective values and how we implement them and how that creates a different economic system. The Rochdale pioneers didn't start the co-op because they believed in, in the, you know, the rights of the industrial uh, mill owners. Actually, it's the, quite the opposite. They wanted to create an alternative to them and actually to own the means of production themselves. And those are the values that we need to do. We need to reset that, obviously, in the context we're operating in. And we need to involve people in that. And we need to grow that out. Um, but we're I mean, do you think, I mean, do you, I'm just thinking yeah. about what happened last year in terms of the election. Do you yeah. think that shift in terms of where the Labour Party stands in being very critical of the neoliberal model, yeah. economic model, has actually attracted a lot of people? Because <laughs> that's helped the movement. Yeah. There's certainly a big push. Yeah. I think it has. I mean, what we need to do is move from there to make it less mm. about... I did a talk this weekend, a momentum meeting, about um, not wanting to create meme-based socialism. That was about how people use social media, changing use social media, because only old people use Facebook, you know, young people use Snapchat and Instagram. Um, so, um, but there is, there is that about we need to move beyond just, you know, sort of sloganeering and simplistic, being simplistic, because we can all go on about, on and on about neoliberals and, you know, the, the excess of capitalism without explaining what we mean and what the alternatives are, and we need to move on from that, and I think that we're beginning to do that. Um, the, I'm going to address the other question here about the money system and MPs. The problem, problem being an MP, right, I don't think peers have got the same problem, is that every day you're bombarded with hundreds of people's problems that you have to try and resolve there and then. And you're constantly, with the, obviously the help of your staff, firefighting all these issues. I, you know, like I said, I didn't watch Blue Planet. The reason I didn't watch Blue Planet is I didn't want to watch Blue Planet. If I was an MP, I'd have watched it. So I haven't got time to watch it because I'm glued to all these issues that people have that I'm trying to resolve all the time. Or, you know, write something or think about, you know, what's the next thing I've got to do next week, what among us speak on the House of Commons or whatever. Um, so people haven't, you know, I can't tell you the last time I read a book from the beginning to the end because you just haven't got time to do that sort of thing. Um, MPs that do, I'd like to know how they do it. Um, so how do we, you know, I've got a basic understanding of how the monetary system works and macroeconomics, um, and, and there are MPs that clearly do, and there are lots of MPs that don't, you know, and that's not the background they came from, and, and that's fair enough to need a, a wide set of people here in Parliament. But how do we do it? Well, we do it through engaging with organisations um, like um, Positive Money. When I came in, actually, I suggested, and it was the person I was meeting with is, is here, that we try and have a basic macroeconomic course for MPs. And there was a bit of email correspondence about trying to do that, trying to get for new MPs, trying to get that going. And then obviously, with the day-to-day, -day, that dropped. And maybe, you know, when we get to recess, I'll try and pick that up again, because I think MPs would go and do it. But it's about finding the time and doing it in a way that you can comprehend it. Thank you. Um, Kevin, do you want to pick up some of those points? Yes, there? I'd love to. Um, um, the gentleman from Norway, um, I love EFTA by the way, if you can put in a good word with your government about us joining, that would be wonderful. But, um, um, yeah, I mean in terms of the whole value system, to me it's a choice, some people want to be part of the rat race, some people don't, and I, I don't make a judgement either way, I think if you decide not to be, you should at least have access to an affordable home and a decent, a decent wage. One thing that did resonate with me back in my, my uh, mid-teens, um, after doing particularly badly I think uh, with my fellow classmates about um, in a physics um, like a mock GCSE or O level as it was then, our physics teacher came into the room and he wiped the blackboard down and he went and the whole room was very quiet and he just wrote across it, the world does not owe you a living. That is part of my philosophy. We all need to provide for ourselves. And maybe in a future world of automation, and, um, as Lady before was talking about, maybe that might be different. For me, given that, I think you should be able to live what life you choose. 
Um, and certainly affordability comes back to that, that what I was saying earlier about land value capture, making sure that housing at least we can, we, is, is affordable, which is a big issue certainly in the UK. Um, in terms of Paul's point, um, how can we make this movement, make it dynamic? We've got to somehow democratise it. I am, uh, if we can just use banks as an analogy, we've got a debate this afternoon on RBS, GRG, um, which is a massive scandal and it shows the power of the banks. I am no fan of fan of the banks at all, but this lady on the, asked the question in the previous round about banks. If ba banks didn't exist, people would borrow money off each other. That's how it worked. It's, it's, they were an enabler. Now, banks are too big. We need to break them up. Uh, how we do that is a good question. Part of this new open banking stuff we've got now, which is legislation allowing, uh, uh, allowing effectively trying to release that stranglehold that banks have and insurance companies have over, over people's finances to try and democratise it. I would say iPhone, cryptocurrency, Facebook, all those things were not invented by governments. They would not never exist if, if governments tried to invent them, I would, uh, I would try and uh, ascertain, uh, I, I would argue. But, um, but we've got to try and democratise those things so that they work in the, to the benefit of all people rather than just a few people. And that's where kind of regulation comes in. In terms of the City of London point, this gentleman asked, um, I agree. I think as politicians, we t spend too much time talking to big business, uh, very powerful financial institutions. We should be talking to small business. Well, I have a small business background. I think they've got just as much should have just as much voice in how we how we structure our economy <coughs> and on the decisions we make. In terms of knowledge of MPs, maybe we picked the wrong MPs. I don't know. I can't speak for Alex, but uh, there are a lot of clever people in here with a lot of experience be it finances or legal or medicine or military or whatever. So there are some people in here that do understand money probably far better than I do. But um, How can we help though? How can, how, how, can, how can we help? Well, things like this are important, so clearly. But uh, back to Alex's point, I've, I've been in business for 25 years before this. If business as anybody knows is in business in this room, you work extremely hard. It's 24 seven occupation. I've never worked so hard in my life since I became an MP. It is extremely, extremely busy, although I did manage to catch Blue Planet to attempt. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to know. Part of my role, anyway. But, uh, but that, that's about the people pressure. I've got to say, that really was a massive wake-up call for a lot of people, not just in terms of Michael Gove, my, my boss, who I, who I, who I try, and, try and help in Parliament, but also in terms of politicians know that if people are exercised about something, they will change. So whether it's the boardroom, boardroom table or the cabinet table, if people are, are annoyed about something or concerned about something, politicians do react. So the more you get concerned about something, you know, the more you can get changed. So I, I think to think that politicians are in charge of people aren't is totally wrong. And in terms of really point, sustainable growth, I don't think growth and sustainability are incompatible or mutually exclusive, not at all. I think what business does, <coughs> business, um, if I can paraphrase Churchill's uh, quote about the Americans, um, business um, will always do the right thing, but only after it tries all the alternatives. It, um, it's like water, it finds a way into everything. So what you've got to do is regulate very carefully and to make sure, make it watertight, so business does the right things. I'm, not, I'm a business person, I'm not criticising business people, not at all, they do a wonderful job, but if you set the conditions that properly, that the outcomes we want to see, I do believe business will respond to it, and I don't think it's GDP growth or economic growth or sustainability. I think the two things are compatible. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Do you want to pick up some of that? Sure. Yeah. Um, when I was working in the House of Commons in the early nineties, one of my heroes was Tony Blair, mm -hmm. and uh, when he retired, he said, "I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was his conviction after fifty years at the coalface mainly as a backbencher, that it is movements that change things. Uh, and you know, you to watch Yes Minister, you know, that old series, you see that civil service put forward three or four options, but there's only one viable option. You know, they've set the agenda in advance, and movements do set the agenda, they do change things. And as Kevin, I will agree with Kevin on this one point, um, which is that you know, politicians do respond. But where I will disagree with Kevin on this point is that idea that the world does not owe you a living. Friends, we owe each other a living. We all owe each other a living. And I cannot go to that 12-year-old child that I met in Calais, uh, a refugee fleeing from Afghanistan, unaccompanied minor, and tell him that I don't owe him a living. We have a collective responsibility to him. And actually, this is absolutely at the fundamental heart of the issue because, as 
as long as we have a system which sets us against one another, that tells us that we do not know what each other are living, uh, that uh, makes us compete with one another over grammar school places, that blames the migrant or the refugee uh, for what are fundamental failings in the economic system, that has a policy of divide and rule, we will not get that movement that we need to bring about change. And so I think we need to take on that very, very hard, those values, and it does come down to values, those values which say we do not owe each other a living. Friends, we do desperately owe each other a living. We owe each other a good life, and that's why we need to ask the question about who the economy is for. It's not for me, it's not for you, it's for absolutely every one of us together, and we are in this together. We are all in this together. Um, I would say I would never, ever say, I would never, say we do not look after the people who cannot look after themselves. Would never say that, have never said that. It's not a personal proof again. No, 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 it's it. that point. But, um, um, like, so how do we bring about that change? Um, I think it's, the change is happening in communities up and down the country. Uh, you can look at, to my own area of land, but you can look at Brixton Energy and the uh, local project there which puts solar panels on the top of housing estates. In an area of low interest rates, uh, you crowdfund it from the local community, you get a return of about 5% on your investment. It creates clean energy, the profits go back into insulating and attacking fuel poverty, and the community gets a dividend. I can point you to the Library of Things, uh, which is a wonderful sharing project uh, where actually a lot of businesses are giving products to this uh, Library of Things, uh, mowers, uh, camping equipment, whatever it might be. Imagine a Library of Things on every street in this country. It would be absolutely revolutionary. Uh, and as we've seen with you know, the opposition to Donald Trump in America uh, and the renewable energy revolution, it is happening often in spite of governments. And certainly in this country, it's happening in spite of the government. You've got a lot of offshore wind, not because the government has invested massively in offshore wind, but because it makes financial sense. It has. And the price has gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it will be movements that change things, and that's what gives me the hope. But at the same time, we need to identify the barriers uh, to stopping that change happening. For example, the electoral system. Again, the electoral system is a barrier, the first part of the electoral system to bring it. So we need to think outside the box and identify where those barriers to change are and take them on one by one. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Kate, if you've got a final couple of sentences to sum up to give us a sense of, I kind of quite like the positive tone that Jonathan's saying about like, where we are and the things that are happening. We're obviously much further down the road to, uh, in terms of growth dependency, or much, um, we need to be further down the road in terms of growth dependency than we are right now. But what is it that's giving you hope right now? Where should we be focusing? And Fran, if you want to come in on that as well for the last minute. Okay, uh, just to go back to the gentleman from the Arctic University, is that what you said? Very cool, very cool. <laughs> okay, and you, you were talking about, can we have a, a, a thriving economy that isn't growing? And I want to connect it to Kevin's statistics, which were really important, that growth, globally has massively reduced poverty, child mortality, hunger. Yes, I absolutely agree. It's why I spent a decade of my career working at Oxfam and at the UN, because I'm passionate about seeing growing economies in the world's lowest income economies. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life. But I would say, at, at standing back and asking, where are we in the global story? Like uh, Ethiopia, Cambodia, they're growing 7 to 10% a year. And if that money is channeled wisely, it can massively improve quality of life. But in nature, nothing tries to grow forever. If any, any biologist, epidemiologist, ecologist will know that nature's growth curve, growth is a wonderful healthy phase, but then things grow up and they mature and they come to thrive, not at a low level of well-being, but at a high level of well-being. And so to me, that's our question of how do we transfer from saying, thinking progress is growth to progress is thriving, whether or not the value of goods and services being sold is rising or not. And I, I'll, I'll end with a quote from Donella Meadows, who if she were still alive, she'd be really tickled to know that she was being quoted here in the British Parliament. So she said, in the 1970s, this is not a new debate, she said, growth is one of the stupidest purposes ever invented by any culture. We've got to have an enough. And when there are calls for more growth, she said, you should always ask, and we should all ask this, growth of what, and why, and for whom? And who pays the cost? And how long can it last? And what's the cost to the planet? And how much is enough? And so I think every question about every debate in this house about growth should be enriched by those questions because when we start to ask those questions, we start to see whether indeed the growth that we are advocating is for people who need it, for the investments that we need towards the thriving world we want. Thank you.
Yeah. I'm very quickly going to pick up on those questions. So, but first, I just want to um, disagree with Kevin. Like, I, I tried to make out in, in my speech that growth and sustainability are incompatible and if we carry on down this road we will extinct ourselves as a species in the coming decades or millennia i think secondly the city of london question i think absolutely that's true it has a much bigger power over westminster than we might realize and that's why we try and scrutinize the bank of england because it's a public institution that sits in the city of london and it is uh you know it was it was founded and its mission is to solve is to serve society but as we know it's 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 continually um, the, playing the balance between the financial markets and the city of London and um, the UK as a whole. And I think that's really important. Um, thirdly, your point about can a country or the UK do this unilaterally? I think um, the UK would be very difficult to do it. Any country that wanted to do a sovereign money system would also need to, you know, there's quite a lot of other things that would need to happen, such as capital controls. Um, you know, we've got one of the biggest financial centres in the world, so could we shift there first? It's unlikely, and you know, Mark Carney is a pretty conservative thinker when it comes to um, monetary things and the economy, but we think that's why it's important to have a radical conversation here in London, and it actually does boost countries like Iceland, Denmark, where it would be possible, I think, to do it unilaterally, to push forward the, the debate. Um, and finally, I just want to end on um, you know, the conversation around value shifting and movement building because um, it is all connected and I don't believe that we'll be able to shift our economy into one that works for society without shifting our value system and without building a social movement that is connected to politics and to things that happen in this building. Um, and I think this is also linked to, picking up on what Kate said, the fact that we have for so long been in this scarcity, scarcity narrative. Nothing's enough. We're not enough. We don't have enough money. And actually, uh, what we need to do in terms of our value shift and movement building, I think, is realise that there are an infinite amount of the things that we really need. Um, there's actually an infinite amount of leadership we could have in this country. I think there's a real lack of leadership currently, mm -hmm. and we need more. There's also an infinite amount of compassion that we could have for each other and other people. I think there's a, in the Western society, there is a lack of compassion, and we can have an infinite amount if we want to. And there's an infinite amount of democracy and empowering people to step forward and to join in debates such as these, whether it's taking official positions of power or simply um, uh, meaning that you ensure all your family go out to vote or whatever, there is an infinite amount of democracy that we can have if we empower each other and we empower people. 